Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Waterlad Podcast. I'm James Marshall and this episode is brought to you by Waterlad Coffee. If you haven't tried this brew yet, go give this freshly roasted coffee bean a try by heading to waterlad.com and clicking the coffee link up the top. Or even better, if you're a cafe and you want to start selling some Waterlad coffee beans, go buy this stuff in bulk and watch your sales go up through the roof. Also, as always, champion harness trainer Regan Todd at Todd's Racing has helped this podcast out massively. So go give Todd's Racing a follow on Facebook and Twitter. And there's a very exciting opportunity coming soon in that space. So look out. Anyway, I have a great guest for you today. So let's get into it. Lad, so one thing that I've learned from the podcast is just how up and down the average rugby career is, but the roller coaster that today's guest has been on is right up there. He is one of the biggest stars in world rugby. He starred for the Manawatu Turbos and the Hurricanes before bursting onto the international scene, which included carving up at the 2015 Rugby World Cup. But on top of all that, he's also struggled with an unfair amount of injuries back to back to back, which has been tough. But one thing that anyone who's played with this guy will know that he is one of the most genuine lads in the game who's had an influence on so many guys' careers and lives. It is, of course, the one and only, the man himself, Nehe Milner Scudder. Welcome, Scuds. Oh, mate, what an intro. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez you're, on, um, you're going bloody well at this. And I think you probably left out um, the key sort of fact, I think, from all that sort of rugby career and experience was um, an unreal mentor who who took me under his guidance back in, back in was it, 2014 or 2015. Uh, that's it, yeah, I guess everything was upwards from there and, and kick-started it started all of that, uh, all that just... <laughs> Mate, well, going through your career, it all did start to happen at 2014, but I cannot take any credit for that. I, I do. We will touch on that because that was one of the most, that was one of the weirdest things. Nehem Ilnaskata had just come into the Hurricanes environment. Mark Hammett asked me if I could be his mentor. And a few of the uh, more senior guys were given mentors and most of the kids coming in were about 18. But then I've been given you, who was probably 10 times more professional than me already and already an absolute wizard. I was like, come on, Hammer, what, what am I supposed to do with this guy? He's already the king. Nah, geez, I probably owe, owe a massive thank you to Hammer for uh, for making you my uh, mentor and, and me your mentee. <laughs> Mate, I've put it on my CV. I am officially your mentor, but I'm not taking any credit for it. But I could maybe make some money from that down the track. If you're my one and only mentee, look look at what you've done. Holy heck. I reckon, bro. What a what a mentor that should be like in you. I don't know. <laughs> we side hustle. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you, you, you were getting into that too, weren't you? I saw uh, you put up the other day that you were looking to start doing some mentoring. Yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah. Um, I guess, well, I think about like all the cool opportunities we get through rugby and, you know, how we go into schools and, and do skills and drills and, and speak to some of the young kids. You know, I get like a bit of a buzz out of that and just seeing how uh, sort of fizz the kids get and probably just alongside that, speaking to my experiences, um, you know, my highs and lows and, and trying to just impart a little bit of, um, I don't know, wisdom or life lessons that, that they can use. And so, yeah, bro, that's something I'm trying to explore. Um, just running some sort of like mentor programs. Um, yeah, just to help help the next youth coming through, bro. Mate, you'd be so good at that. I'd be keen to jump on that and be, be <laughs> guided by you. <laughs> no, I'm getting you in as a special guest, but you'll be definitely helping me run the program, a mentoring program with, with the 101. <laughs> but in all seriousness, though, um, You've always been good at that, like your relationship with fans throughout your career. You, you've been one of the best players that I've ever seen in terms of being able to, I guess, communicate with your fans and your fans all adore you. Um, they love your sidestep, but what you do to them about giving your time, you've always been pretty special at that. Oh, geez. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> um, for me, I probably remember when I was a little kid and I know I hear a lot of other Athletes speak about their um, sort of times as a younger, mm. younger sports boy, sports boy coming up, and their heroes would, um, you know, just give up whether it's five seconds just to say hello and in a in a smile or a photo and an autograph, you know, just means the world. So um, for me to be able to do that, bro, I don't 
yeah, it just takes five seconds out of your time and that could make someone's day and something that they'll always remember, which is um, a cool position to be in. And mm. I think oh, part of that, bro, like going a little bit deeper, it's always been a person that finds it hard to say no. And so that probably comes at a bit of a, a detriment. Just, uh, um, you know, spread myself, I guess, too much in terms of, um, yeah, doing heaps for other people. But at the same time, bro, I get a lot of uh, meaning and a lot of joy out of doing that as well. Mate, you're a good kid. Anyway, mate, what are you what are you up to at the moment? Because I know you're back with Manua too, assistant coach. I saw your name down, one of the great coaches. Um, are you are you still available to play? Yes, yeah. So I've taken up um, a playing coaching role back at Manua too again. This is probably I was trying to count how many years from my first year there. I think it's like my twelfth season or eleventh season. Yeah. So it's yeah, definitely one of the quarters in the team, <laughs> but um. Yeah, bro. A uh, playing coaching role. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got the selection um, responsibility in terms of what my coaching role is, but <laughs> I'm available. Yeah, still available to pay, play um, training and stuff with the boys and just doing a bit of coaching. Yeah, just game strategy and a bit of IPP stuff on the side to um, yeah, help out Pete and, and Greg and. Jamie Booth is is a part of the coaching staff now. That poor bugger's had a um, rough run with injuries, so it's yeah. good to have his knowledge of the game and, and just his leadership in a, in a coaching capacity too, bro. So exciting times. It's a little bit of a different dynamic, I think, like mm. sort of going from that playing to coaching. Yeah. Um, I'd have to get yeah, you to give me a few tips and stuff <laughs> as well. Apparently you've been just killing it on the coaching front. Um, yes. Very young for the boys. So, geez, what? Yeah. I'll, I'll be hitting you up, bro. Mate, whatever you've done for those turbos, though, they, they, they were on fire the first couple of rounds. Unlucky not to get the win over Canterbury. Yeah, well, I actually started a bit late into the piece, so I can't <laughs> claim any of that. Mate, I hate <laughs> yeah, to but, see them yeah, after look COVID. Out from, yeah, but, yeah, exactly. I was going to say look out from here on in. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, they've got a lot of, not to say that the boys in the past haven't been awesome players, but there's been a few, probably over a dozen of new New lads from out of the region that are coming. Um, a few good players in, in key positions like Brett Cameron. Mm. Um, he's been he's been killing it, and good to get him back home. Ish in a way, I know he's from Wanganui, just up the road a bit. But um, now nah, he's been awesome, bro. And I think yeah, it's exciting. Mm. But I think that COVID stopped that run a little bit. And but yeah, I don't know. There's probably worse things to be complaining about than just getting back on the rugby field. Yeah. And how's your shoulder feeling? Shoulder's good, bro. Yeah, it's um, still hanging in there. Sort of got through, he had a couple of years just recently, just trying to rehab and get it back to, um, get it back to fitness where I could be playing again and got back out on the field for one or two last year, sort of strung a whole season together and then yeah. um, we got through some footy this year. So shoulder's good, bro. Yeah. What percentage do you reckon it's at? Like what's, what's really stopping you from being picked at the moment? Is it your shoulder or? Um, you, yeah, it's, it's a few different conversations and a few different um, answers to that question, which yeah, I've posed many a times as to, <laughs> you know, giving me, giving me a crack. It's probably differing opinions, but in my opinion, um, ego aside, yeah, it is probably um, the shoulder and, and just trying to get that confidence back. It's, yeah. um, I find it's hard, bro, because... Yeah, like we were touching on those years of like 2015 and was out for 2016, but those are sort of what people compare my level and ability to, which is mm. something that I compare myself to, like to set that sort of standard and have that own expectation of where I want to take my game and how I want to perform every time. Um, it's a tough, tough marker, I guess, to compare myself against. And yeah. sort of, but in saying that, though, it's a challenge and, and something that I'm, you know, still keen to push to get to that level even or even higher mm. uh, yeah. oh well hopefully hopefully we can see you back on, out on that track shortly after this lockdown finishes but anyway we've got a massive bit of a run sheet to get through uh unbelievable career i'm looking forward to this one but we've got to start at the start like all good stories uh what was it like when a young nehi sidestepped his way out oh um i don't know where to start on that like a lot of my upbringing bro during my youth i played heaps of touch obviously like not being the biggest um 
like this fella running around, you know, I love playing touch rugby, my older brother, all my family, all my mates and that would probably either be training or playing most nights of the week, um, growing up in the metropolis of, of Palmerston North. So the touch scene was was absolutely humming um, back then for me as a, as a young fella growing up and that sort of, I don't know, developed those little soft skills around footwork and, and catch pass and sort of reading, you know, defence setups and all that sort of thing, which yeah. is still something I try and implement into my game now. Uh, and then from from there, bro, I actually started, oh, I played rugby at high school, went to Queen Elizabeth College, um, give, give QC a big shout out. Um, I was lucky enough to make the first, in the only 15, we only had one team right back in oh, high school, sorry. so <laughs> must have been yeah, tracking pretty well to to make that team and, and be captain for a few games and, and be the goal kicker and, and <laughs> different positions because I was probably the one that turned up to most of the trainings. Um, and yeah, from there, it was, it was kind of weird. Like, I didn't make any rep teams growing up um, because I was at a small school. We sort of weren't really looked at for the one or two age grade teams. Mm. And yeah, I don't know, just it was what it was. And then I actually shifted to league um, in my first couple of years out of high school and went over to Sydney for two years to play in the Toyota Cup, mm. the under 20s. Uh, so that was a cool experience, bro. Like the training mentality of, of yeah, I'd probably say Australians, bro, and sort of their old school. Um, mindset like we had a Gary Carden was his name um over in at the Bulldogs bro and he was this old fella that would just it was like a drill sergeant on roids in terms of like the training <laughs> that we did and the workouts and the conditioning sessions and we used to just get smashed bro pretty much every every day and um that was just a massive eye opener for me I think sort of being over in a whole different country, being away from family, just getting thrashed every day, like yeah. training, bro. It, was, it was real tough. But yeah, I think that sort of set me up in terms of, you know, what was to, what was to come from there. I didn't actually crack NRL, which is which was my dream and my goal after the two years and twenties. So I came home back to Palmy and then uh yeah, switched back to rugby and started playing club club yeah. rugby back in Palmy. Had you played league before you'd gone over or had you just been scouted from your rugby days? Um, no, so I played like from the age of six, I think, to up to 10. So like, oh, true. Yeah, like first sort of sport, I played league before rugby. Mm. Um, but then during high school, sort of switched to union because there wasn't really much of a um, league comp in Palmy for kids. And so... Yeah, that was my first sort of taste at it. And then I actually moved down to Wellington for my last half of my seventh form year and joined up with David Lomax in this uh, league academy that he ran out in the hut. And then he had contacts over in Aussie, bro, and a few of us got the opportunity to go over and trial. And then, um, yeah, a few of us did all right and stayed over there the preseason and hung around for a few more years. Crazy. And, and what was it like at that Canterbury Bulldog setup? Like, other than the hard training, you were obviously a young kid. What was your living sort of ex, uh, experience like? Uh, bro, so I moved around sort of a few different living um, arrangements. I stayed with a cousin and her family out by Parramatta. And so it was tough, bro. I was having to like catch a bus, two trains, walk about 20 minutes just to get to training because he was oh, like. Right. Sydney's massive, bro, and everything's so spread out. So it'll take a good couple of hours um, via public transport just to get to training and then the same thing going home or um, doing a bit of teacher's aid work over there, working in like a sports store. Bro. I was, um, it was a bit of a grind, but uh, even talking about it now, like I look back at it thinking far out, that sort of, you know, built a bit of resolve and a bit of life, life mm. experience, I guess, to what I went through. So what what stopped you from getting an NRL crack? Because you were carving it up. You, I think you and Benny Barber was it. You guys had a some unreal <laughs> combo out there <laughs> from memory. Oh, bro! I only played like a couple of games with with Ben because he um, he was a year above me. But oh, he was the yeah, like same, bro. He was killing it. He was still eligible for twenties, um, but he was playing first grade oh. and then like ripping it up. So I think I might have only played a couple of games with him um, at the doggies and. 
we had some pretty good players, bro, like there's Josh Jackson. Um, I think he's captain of the Bulldogs now. Yeah. Dale Finucan, um, who's played Origin. Yeah. Uh, who else is there? Martin Topo, Sam Cassiano, uh, Tim Lafayre. Yeah, there's a few boys that sort of kicked on sure. um, to first grade. And yeah, I don't know, at the time, the Bulldogs were stacked, bro, from their first grade squad through to like even reserve New South Wales Cup. So they just said, oh, look, we don't really, yeah, we haven't got a spot for you. Um, yeah, sorry about that and all the best. So, bro, it was funny because I was trying to think of like what, what to do after that and I had family my brother was living up in um, Brisbane at the time so I was like I might just go up to Queensland and just work or go across to Perth WA I've got family there and just work in the mines and True. just try and do it, earn some coin and and just live over there for a bit and just have a break from from footy and just experience other stuff but um yeah at the same time bro, I was pretty homesick so I just yeah made the call to come back to Palmy and, and get into the get into union Mate, that's crazy. Crazy to hear we almost lost you to the mines. That would have been mad. <laughs> so, so you just went back to Manawatu Two on your own terms with no contract, just playing club rugby? Yeah, pretty much, bro. Like I still had like, heaps of friends in that back in um back in Palmy at the time. Like one good friend of mine is uh, Johnny Leota. He was sort of a legend around the Manawatu Two rugby circles, played down at the lands for a bit. Mm. Um and so we we grew up um they're playing touch and that together and he actually got me to go to his club Marist um when I come back from Aussie and he took me under his his wing and did heaps of sort of skills and training and gym sessions and all that and it was probably yeah thanks to him oh heaps of people bro but he was one key key figure that um helped me when I got back to Palmy and put in a good word with Renz Dave Rennie at the time um just uh I don't know, have a look at me over club rugby and, and see how I go. And yeah, I was lucky to pick up a, a turbos contract at the end of that season. And you, you debuted pretty quickly that year too, eh? Ah, uh, yeah, that was the, mm. my first year with the turbos. It might have been might have been a Northern game at home. And we had, yeah, I remember playing against like Rennie Ranger, who was yeah, the man, or he still is the man, but yeah. he was killing it back then. So that yeah. was a bit of a buzz, bro, playing against someone of his, his stature. But then also for us with the turbos, we had, you know, like Aaron Cruden. Um, Aaron Smith, Callum Gibbons. Oh, all lads. Speaking of, speaking of lads and, and absolute legends, bro. So, yeah, um, I was pretty lucky to be in the mix with, with heaps of awesome fellas and awesome rugby players that helped um, uh, yeah, grow my game and take it to another level. Did you feel ready to play when you were given the shot? Did you feel like you were ready for that level? Um, nah, probably not. Like, it's probably a common theme through most of my career, bro, just getting thrust into like the next level up so quick. Mm, like mm. one season at club, been playing ITM. Oh, sorry, there was probably a gap between NPC to Super. Like I yeah. played three, four seasons before that step up, but then that Super to All Blacks was, you know, that same season as well. Mm. Um, but I guess, yeah, you never really know until you're until you're in there doing it, bro. So, yeah, I was kind of just riding the wave and, and trying to just work on my game and had awesome people around me who experienced fellas. Another one was Craig Clear and Casey Stone, Junior Tomasi Tama, guys who, you know, helped improve my game heaps. And you, and did you have an injury the following year? Is that sort of what stopped you from progressing a little bit quicker? Um, geez. Trying to think of my um, injury history. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back a few for this one. <laughs> <laughs> nah, yeah, bro. I think that might have been. I think I had just like um, real niggle, like soft tissue. Oh yeah, injury. So it might have been like a tight calf. My hammies used hammies, to go heat. Yeah. Bro, yeah. I wish I could say it was from being too quick, but um, yeah, not enough Nordic pills. I think. <laughs> but yeah, the hammies just going all sort of. Yeah, just bro, like real niggly couple of week injuries that were kind of just compound, and so yeah. it wasn't yeah major ones until until that shoulder. But yeah, it was kind of yes that second year turbos kick started a little niggles, which yeah injury runs bro, a bit mm-hmm. frustrating, eh? Yeah, but then the following year you must have had a reasonably good season to get the call into the Hurricanes wider squad. 
And then that's when what we sort of already talked about, where this career sort of really looked to fast track pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I can't remember what year was it. I'm trying to think of that game in Levin. It was like a mid season one. Did you play that? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, against Crusaders, so I think. Yeah. Because a lot of the, your guys, Canes boys, were away with the All Blacks. And um, I know, yeah, me and Cully from 1 or 2 came in, That's got right. caught in just to play that. And from there, bro, I just started or kept having conversations with um, Alama. Um, and then he just said, oh, look, like, yeah, play well in uh, NPC this season and we'll try and get you into like a wider training contract uh, for 2014. So, mm. yeah, sort of happened from that opportunity bro just getting that game in your guys mid-season break or something against crusaders and Levin. mate those games are so underrated as a player i reckon because so many opportunities come from those games that people don't realize people often think oh i gotta play a development game or oh, this this game don't really want to play this not on tv that sort of stuff but it's crazy how many guys get opportunities from playing well in those games a hundred percent there'll be like so many and I think even thinking back to that time, that might have been the only one on the like the season calendar. Whereas mm. now like, we've got a whole sort of five, six games of like Kane's development games or all the Super Rugby um, teams have heaps of games where guys that are just like floating under the radar mm. in club or in the provincial unions, bro, they just get like one crack, rip it up, and then suddenly you know they'll get caught into train or people are talking about them, which yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty cool. But like you say, we're so taken for granted. Yeah, I agree. So then you, you're into the Hurricanes environment now. How, how did you find that? Obviously, there's a lot of legends at the time in that setup. You had the Ma'as, the Conrads, all of those guys. And how did you find meeting all these boys? It was pretty daunting. Um, yeah, those two names that you mentioned as well as like the Corey Danes, the Julian Savias, the Jimmy Marshalls, <laughs> uh, you know, like just sort of walking around like far out. These are all my idols and I'm um, sitting next to them in, in the changing rooms and, and running out to the training paddock with them. So um, and the fact that I was like far out, it was almost, I don't know if the term's that imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, we like have to almost – yeah, tell yourself so much that you're worthy of being there mm. just because you're like far out these guys are like all blacks and I'm just coming out of NPC and these guys are legends so it's like I'm just some fellow who's just rocked up and, and keen to have a crack and um, yeah pretty pumped up but like what I've learned bro is like having that sort of mindset and speaking to heaps of different people like you get chosen for a reason like you mm. wouldn't be there if, if you weren't good enough and, and just to have trust and not only like the coaches are picking you but like in your own ability so um with that bro even speaking to guys like yourself and, and the cjs and that you guys made me feel pretty relaxed and pretty comfortable and you know and at home and um even like when i try and speak to other younger players or new people into environments where i sort of take what i learned from you guys and try and make them feel welcome because i know how how like freaky it is and how mm. sort of scary it can be. But then just by having a conversation and uh, reassurance, bro, it sort of puts you at ease and, and allows you to just focus on going out and, and enjoying it and playing rather than like, oh, man, what about this? What, what if I stuff up? What about this? Yeah. So, That's crazy to hear about that because I never pictured you to be one of those guys. I always thought you were really confident in your own ability. You had all the skills. Everyone was sort of just – waiting for you to get an opportunity because they knew that you were going to explode like you did. So it's interesting to hear that you had those um, self-doubts coming into that environment, which I never really expected from you. Yeah, it's um, it's funny, bro, because like even, I guess, through my journey with like mental well-being and that I probably wouldn't have been able to articulate it or sort of understand it properly. Mm. So at the time, like I might have been sort of feeling it in a way but I didn't actually know how to express that and it's only through I guess like these last four or five years and getting a little bit older and life experience and a bit more self-awareness you actually like oh far out that's what I was feeling at the time and that's what I was going through whereas like you don't know what you don't know and so yeah it's an interesting one bro like yeah not to say that if I did feel those things but it's probably like I didn't actually know how to like communicate it in the way that I 
yeah. that I do now. Yeah, that makes sense. Does make sense, and it's a hard thing to communicate, isn't it? Like, how do you um, start yeah. a conversation with someone about that when you're going into a new team? Who who do you feel comfortable enough to go up and tell them about your self doubts and things like that? Yeah, totally, bro. It's um, it's yeah, hitting the nail on the head eh, in terms of how you know that conversation in particular, but so many other conversations in that space regarding like our. Um, you know our issues or things we're struggling with or we're not mm. coping is actually like how do we how do we start that conversation um, how do we build that trust or those relationships to be able to go into those spaces and or, yeah I think that's yeah such a like key issue for heaps that we need way more educational pieces and tools on how to actually go about that bro that's um, yeah Mm, it's interesting. Hey, well, as your mentor, I feel like I probably should have picked up on some of those cues and uh, <laughs> initiated some of those chats. I've let you down. <laughs> nah, nah, but not, not at all. There's, nah, there's, I definitely do not feel let down by, by you and your uh, mentor. So that's for sure. <laughs> but then following that season with the Canes, you went back with the Turbos and that's where you lit up the competition that year. Turbo's had a really successful season. I think you were named Player of the Year in the championship, and you guys won that championship that year. Yeah, bro, 2014. We were, yeah, I don't know, for some reason, yeah, we were humming that year. We had like a lot of experience, guys who were probably into like their third or fourth year NPC, um, the same team as well that we've had for the previous few seasons. And so there was that, um, that continuity, that whatever what's that term that gets chucked around, that cohesion. Mm. Um, nice. That was a yeah, big factor in our success and um, good culture as well. There's another one. Uh, we all the boys just enjoyed each other's company and we sort of knew what we were trying to do on the field as well in terms of our game plan. Uh, and yeah, everyone like from one to a squad of 30, close to 30, you know, everyone was just wanting to compete and, and be the best and everyone just, or, you know, those sort of eight, nine, ten out of ten games most weeks. And yeah, bro, stoked that we we're able to win it that year or the championship division that year against um our our arch enemies up, up the line about Hawk Space. Mm-hmm. So okay. yeah, that was a cool cool year for us and, and for me personally, because I think that back into that year I was lucky enough to get picked in the Moldy All Blacks team as well to go to Japan for a couple of games. And um oh yeah, just the how much you you know, the Māori culture means to me and, and how proud I am of that to get named in that for me and my family, bro, it was huge. Mm. And what was that tour like? Bro, that was, so that was like my first experience in like a black jersey or like a, you know, a representative team and for it to be based around like Māori culture, bro, was, was like real cool because it enabled me or allowed me to reconnect with, with my culture. So like very most team meetings would start with like a couple of songs, um, giving like a bit of a brief history on all the boys, like where they're from, like different iwis and different regions um, around the country. And so was, yeah, as well as trying to perform on the field, bro, I was sort of like, a, you know, learning about who we are and where we're from, mm. which for, you know, talk about identity and things like that. That's, it's massive, bro. So that was a cool, cool experience. And then also like playing with pretty much most of the team were all super rugby players, um, incredible leaders. And to go to Japan as well was, uh, yeah, it was pretty surreal. It was mm. awesome. Could you speak Māori? I can speak a little bit. Like I can read it. Um, I can understand like what people are saying, but I struggle to sort of hold a conversation. Like I can kind of yeah. chuck in a few words here and there. But in terms of actually being able to converse um, fully, bro, nah, I struggle. But that's something I'm still here yeah, trying to chip away at. And um, like around um, like increasing my vocab, trying to figure out sentence structures, trying to just be able to speak, like hold a conversation in, in yeah. Te Reo. So I've got like heaps of books and resources, um, doing a few online courses. I'm quite lucky because heaps of my family and, and I've got mates in that that can speak it fluently so every time I sort of get on the phone to my mum or my sister I try and just tell them to speak to me like fully in te reo and it'll just be radio silence for a little bit while I try <laughs> to piece together what they're saying but um, 
yeah, it's all about it's more quality time that we get to spend together as well. Hundred percent. And then, so following your uh, Manawa two season where you lit it up, you earned a full squad spot with the Hurricanes, and then the rest is history, pretty much. Eh? you got your debut against the Force. First touch. See you later. Set up one of the greatest tries in Hurricanes history, and um, Nehe Milner Scatter, the legend, was born, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. If it was probably Jules can take, you know, <laughs> most of the recognition from there. So I just yeah, ran about five meters and passed it to him to run 60 and bounced yeah. off about four, five in the lead up to that try. But um, yeah, that was, that was quite funny, bro, because when you speak about like injuries just before, I think that's, well, yeah, part of injuries and, and just not getting picked around missing the first two games. I think we, we started in Africa and I was actually touch and go to travel because we had our last, what was it, preseason game in Auckland against the Blues and I think I tweaked my NCL. Oh, true. And so Boyd and, and the medical team were like, oh, far out, how bad is it? Um, should we just keep them in NZ and wait till we come home? And I was lucky enough to get on the plane and, and be the food dog for a couple of weeks and enjoy <laughs> um, <laughs> What's the Joburg? Is it um, Monte Casino? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Park up next to Callum Gibbons and get a few um, strawberry milkshakes. <laughs> um, poolside, and then uh, yeah, bro, lucky enough to get my get a crack uh, when we flew back through through Perth against the Force. So you felt ready going into that game against the Force. You were ready to have your crack now, eh? Yeah, yeah. Well. Partly because I'd done a couple of weeks training at altitude, and um, <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm more than ready. Uh, but in saying that, though, we we came off the back of two wins, and so trying to understand, yeah, I want to be playing, but what's what's best for the team as well? Just to you know, in terms of winning three games on the road uh, to start off that season, that'll be massive, and mm. not yeah, just to keep the boys you know, that consistency and, and keep the same team out there probably be what's best for the team. But at the same time, I was kind of like, nah, 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 get me, get me in there. And Boydy, um, yeah, bailed me up at breakfast. I think one of the mornings I just said, oh, look, here we're going to give you, start you off, or bring you off the bench this week. So I was like, oh, you beauty. You beauty, all right. And, mate, that season you were just on absolute fire. Every game you'd come up with highlights that most people would be proud of to have throughout their career in every single game. It was just whatever you touched turned to gold and you could beating defenders left, right and centre. How did it, how does it feel when you're in that moment? You know, you're, you, you know, you're on a run. I've never been in it. Oh, well, I've seen, I've seen um, one, one run of yours that just popped <laughs> my head straight away as that try against the Landers up in Napier. I <laughs> feel like Jonathan Thurston saying, like, oh, you got spiders on him and, like that's exactly what comes to my head and I think if you're running that game bro like I'm, I'm sure you beat like just about the whole team I was like oh well, mate I might have to find that footage and uh, bring it back up <laughs> thanks for bringing that up I think it was in the 63rd third minute bro so I'll, I'll, I'll go to for you but I don't know in all seriousness like I just wanted to express myself I guess like have a crack from anywhere, everywhere. Every time I got the ball, I was like, I will just try not to get tackled. Um, I've been practicing this side step for about 20 odd years now, so I might as well put it together and see how it goes. Um, but, bro, like, even when I talk to people about that Kane season, like, you like, you got to look at our team, like, who we had, the firepower throughout our whole squad. And so, you know, when I'm playing outside the all black midfield, um, an all black first five, an all black halfback, pretty much, you know, it was what was it just you and I that went? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you were an all black not long after. You you went straight in there. I was like, far out. Do, we, do you and I rock off to see who's going to be the uncapped <laughs> player in the Canes this week? <laughs> but like, sorry, so I don't know. For me, it just shows the what you can do when you're playing around like incredible players and as a defensive coach or I don't know putting a defensive hat on and and previewing the Hurricanes you're probably like oh yeah sweet we'll just 
to fend up against all these players and leave this fella because <laughs> you don't know who he is. <laughs> He's too uncapped, guys. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, don't worry about that. Them boys will just uh, they'll probably drop it or something like that, or they will probably won't even get the ball. So um, that, that probably worked in worked in our favour big time, I reckon. Yeah. What about um the final? Um, that year was such an awesome year. We, mate, we're winning games left, right, and centre. But then come to the big final, the big showdown. We we don't quite do enough. What are your memories from it? Um, yeah, bro. I don't, I don't know. It's kind of like a, a very, very distant memory. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was probably just that whole. Uh, I don't know. I heard the word complacency get bandied about, and sort of probably already playing playing the game before we got to it. Like that week, there were a whole lot of like celebrations and things like that and, and creating all this hype, bro. And I know for me, I probably got caught up in it and didn't, um, in terms of like my own individual performance, like I wasn't up there in terms of what I what I would have been proud of. It was probably a, you know, a generous six. Um, whereas, yeah, other games in the season, I was sort of humming and mm. probably the whole um, enormity of the game you know, having a sellout uh, Westpac, the hype during the week, um, probably going into the game as favourites as well. Mm. You know, we played the Landers a few weeks prior in, in Napier and put a score on them. And yeah, we probably just probably weren't as hungry and all those sorts of words when, when that whistle went. It's an interesting one, eh? Big finals footy when the, when the pressure comes on. Like you talk about that week, that crowd, it was, it was an, it was an awesome occasion, but so disappointing to fall short, eh? Yeah, bro. Yeah, incredibly uh, deflating. I think, bro. One thing I'm always pissed off at my or gotten over a little bit, but after the game, so I had like heaps of family, like we all, all the boys did, and a lot of support, friends, and that that made the trip. Not only for that game, but throughout the season, and bro, because we lost and felt pretty disappointed, like. I think, I don't know if all of us went into the change room straight after, but I went in there and didn't actually like go and see my family in the crowd. And mm. I was kind of like, yeah, I feel stink and I'm having a winch and a sulk. Um, but like, that's a big regret for me and something I don't, I've learned from that is like, whether we win or we lose, like still actually acknowledging people who have traveled, who have paid money, who had supported throughout the whole season. And for me to just like, ghost them and be like nah if I don't want to see anyone I'm having an assault when we go into the change rooms just felt real stink bro and mm. um, yeah that's that's a big sort of another thing that I remember from that that mate, final as well so. mate I like that and that's so common I mean not often you get after a loss like that you'll see the players still walking around doing the signatures but mate if you change your mentality around like what you're talking about that would be that'd be awesome to see teams after a loss still going and acknowledging their supporters or their family and stuff. I like that. Yeah, because I reckon, um, like, you can definitely be pissed off, but yeah. save it, you know, save it until you get back into the, into the change rooms. Like, that's not to say that you, yeah, to just be like, oh, fuck, we lost, but all good, all good. So, you know, sweet as, like, still feel stink, but do it in the right way. Mm. Um, and, yeah, that's sort of something I will try and, yeah, pass on or yeah, carry on to carry on those behaviours as well, mate. I like it. And then obviously from that year, you're on absolute fire. Did you know that you were going to sort of be called into the All Blacks? Did you have an inkling that you were going to be in the frame? Nah, bro, not at all. Um, yeah, like yeah, dreams and aspirations and stuff to make teams and that, but like to actually. For it to be like you know reality, it's, mm. it seems just so much even like crazier and and so much further from what's actually going on. So, no, nah, I didn't didn't get an inkling whatsoever. Like you look at the Izzy Dags, the Corey Danes, the Charles Piertows, the Julian Saviers, like where outside backs in New Zealand rugby has always have always been you know just you pick twenty that could easily chuck on a black jersey, and I don't think my name was one of them. Um, but funny yarn, like I remember when the team got announced and um, Han and I were in, at home in Wellington and uh, I actually like put on a feed, put on some porridge, some oats in the microwave 
back to him and feed and him was like, oh, we'll watch the announcement. I was like, oh, you know, what a waste of time. I'm just going to have a feed. And I was in the kitchen uh, waiting for the microwave to finish and I just heard her like yelling out, screaming, come on, come in here, like just losing it. Sure. And I went in and I just like caught the last of my name getting um, like along the bottom of the screen. Oh. And I was just like, nah, you're, you're taking the piss, like what's going on? Surely this is a G up and then, yeah, the phone went berserk and yeah, bro, it was, it was happening. Mate, that's awesome. Mate, I've got a bit of goosebumps listening to that. That's cool. Uh, yeah, it's um, like beyond, beyond like my imagination is the, the feeling, actually witnessing it happening, like, yeah, in front of me and watching it on TV and yeah, it was just crazy, bro. So surreal. And then going into the All Blacks environment, how did you feel? Because you you spoke about probably being pretty intimidated at first going into the Manawatu Two environment, and then a few years later, now you're walking into probably the, one of the most intimidating environments in in the world. What was it like? Yeah, well, like I think we were first assembled and we went into this big sort of big team meeting room, and I think first person I saw might have been like Kevin Mialamu, and then. Tony Woodcock, um, Richie McCall, and then Dan Carter, and I was like, far out. Like, what do, what do I say to these guys? So I'd be like, oh, hey, mate, hey, so I'll like, maybe me or like, introduce myself. Or, yeah, so that's like, that's why I was like, oh, you've got to bury me here, me here. And they're like, oh, yeah, hey, like, Kevin or Kevy or Richie. I'm like, oh, yeah, hey, Rich. <laughs> real, like, real awkward, eh? Real awkward, but like, Funny now when I look back at it and um, and think to yeah first meeting them and then all the stuff with trainings and meetings and, and games playing alongside them for us uh, it was crazy it was funny yarn though because we actually flew into Christchurch I think we first assembled there but we landed at the same time as the uh, Landers boys oh, yeah. and so that was for like maybe a few days after the final. And it was like, yeah, the polar opposites in terms of, <laughs> you know, energy and, and morale. Like, we had all the Canes boys just, like, looking like we wanted to fight someone. And, and the Landers boys, like, were just high on life for happy years. And, yeah. Yeah. We couldn't really understand why, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's classic. And did you feel comfortable when you first made your debut? Because I... From memory, it was against um, Australia, and you scored a couple of tries too. I think. Oh, I don't know if you ever feel or like levels of comfort like playing in the All Blacks. There's so much um, hype and so much pressure around it. But I was lucky enough because I actually missed. I think it was the first couple of games. Like the boys played. I might have played one game in New Zealand, and then they travelled to South Africa, and then I was. Yeah, name for that third game, and so that was a that was an interesting week because we spent half the week in Auckland. I think they wanted to change up like the usual prep. So I think most of the time you travel and you spend the whole week in in the city preparing. But we went over there on like a Wednesday, so we just had the one training and then the captain's run and then play. So that was probably good because I was able to I don't know just. I was used to being in Auckland or like being at home, whereas being in like Aussie again and like the media and stuff like that yeah. probably would have been a bit overwhelming. So that made me a bit more comfortable. Um, what threw me out of my comfort zone was our training, bro. On like it's like those big training sessions uh, towards the back end of the week. Yeah, and I ended, I remember this bro so vividly. Like I was defending on the right wing getting like a halfway 50 meter line out. And I think the boys, the DDs did like a two pass and kicked to the opposite corner. Right? And I just got on my like jets to try and cover that back corner. And I wasn't looking bro. And I turned, I probably sprinted about five meters and smashed into Steve Hansen. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so you know how like the um, coaches are like plotted uh, <laughs> yeah. all around the field, bro, and they were like mic'd up saying, oh, line out here, scrum here, all blacks, blah, blah, blah. So he was sort of just smack bang in the middle of the field, bro, and I just I was like watching the ball like be kicked, just gunned it, bro, and smacked into him. 
And um, I'd like to not know whether to help him up or just carry on, like play on and get the ball. And yeah, I was like, oh, far great, sweet, mean. Just before my debut, two days out, I'd just like smoke the coach. Um, and yeah, he was all good. Like he, he had ended up getting played like the following week in one of the team meetings because it was captured on film. Yeah. And he didn't see like, I think it was Bears kick kick to the other corner, I take off, smash the hands, and then he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> just like huddled over on the, on the ground. Bro. And yeah, I'm glad he, he found it amusing eventually, but um, yeah, I was like, am I still in the team for this week? Or what's, what's the story? Right, that's so good. What is what is Shag like? Was he was he intimidating bloke? Yeah, I found him pretty intimidating. Like, well, after you get to know him, like, he's pretty... He's got like a real good understanding of new players and like experienced players. So like yeah. he won't like if you if you're new, like he understands that it's so it's a high pressure situation. So he tries to make you feel as comfortable as possible by like just having conversations. Like I remember it was like me, Weiss, uh, Cody Taylor, we were sort of the new boys in that um name for that campaign, Sops. And like Steve was always sort of just by us telling us like what we were seeing, giving us little tips, like bro, so much encouragement. Mm. And I think that was, um, yeah, that was different because you hear sort of stories about him or you see how he interacts with the older players. And, yeah. Well, like, it's almost like that, um, like being the youngest in, in the family, like the youngest sibling. <laughs> yeah. like, like, Gets away with all sorts. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. um, the AB setup is such like next level to be able to feel as like, comfortable and, and at ease is is so important and so he had, yeah he was pretty pretty good at doing that by encouraging us like having conversations with us not expecting us to you know score three tries or nail every single thing it's just like cool here's a couple of things to focus on uh reminding us that we're like good enough to be there another situation which helped bro was so the leadership group and Gilbert Anoka, uh, that first week we assembled, he got all the young boys together and just said, oh, look, like, if you guys have any um, issues or, you know, you're finding it tough, just come and talk to us. Like, it was pretty much just like a chicken, chicken group. And to have, I think it was Rito was there as well, probably three or four of the, the big dogs, mm. like, actually wanting to get get to know us and, and show that they, they cared, you know, meant heaps for us. and. I know, like going forward and and playing a few games and stuff like that. There was always um, yeah something that helped us get through that. Hey, that's cool to hear. So then the World Cup later that year, how was it going to that? Did you were you expecting to be named now because you'd obviously played well in every opportunity you were given to date? Oh, not really because I think I'd only played yeah so that debut game and then the following week in Auckland before they. We're getting into the announcements of the World Cup squad. So mm. I was like, so, like, man, grateful for those two games. Like, to, they played for the All Blacks, but sweet. I'll just look forward to NPC and back with one or two. And then, yeah, I remember being at home in Palmy at my parents' house and, and Shandy, the All Blacks manager, rang up and uh, yeah, gave me the good news. And so we had to get down to Wellington because they did a big announcement and the big squad reveal at Parliament. Oh, that's right. Um, but even then, bro, like, guys who missed out, like Charles Piertel, Izzy, um, Corey Jane, and they were all in that uh, rugby championship, that Widdersloe like, squad that I was in. And, bro, yeah. like, when I speak of, like, Corey Jane at the Canes, like, he was still awesome in that all black set up. But Izzy Dag was, very like, an absolute, like, lad. We roomed, roomed together a few times, and, bro, he was, he was awesome to – just to learn from and see how he how he operates. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so for them, like for me, I was like, oh yeah, those guys are sure and so they'll be they'll be in there and I'll be cheering them on. Um yeah, when they when they go for the World Cup. Yeah, that is buzzy, yeah. I, I forget that all those players missed out on that uh World Cup squad, but the squad that you took was still one of the best all black sides in history, I reckon. Looking at that squad, it was so stacked that had all the greats in one squad. Yeah, bro, like so many greats and I think 
what held that team together, especially come those like playoff games, was a lot of them had played 2007 and then 2011 as well. Um, and so having all these legends, but then there were a few sort of younger and experienced players who were just trying to bring fizz and bring fizz and energy to the group. Um, so it was yeah, a real good balance for our board and all the coaching and support staff did a good job to sort of fuse that together and um like remember our game plans leading sort of throughout the pool round robin games we we're trying to sort of hold back and not show too much and save it for the without getting ahead of ourselves and thinking we we're already in the finals but just trying to keep mm-hmm. things up our sleeve for the for the quarters bro and uh yeah that france game and and Cardiff for that quarterfinal was, yeah, bro, that was something else. That was crazy, man. Did you feel the extra pressure at a World Cup or just playing for the All Blacks, you were already feeling enough pressure already? Did you feel the extra pressure of a World Cup? Um, yeah, bro, yeah, to be honest. And that, it was that first game. Um, we played RG, I want to say it was at Wembley or one of the big big stadiums over there, which had might have been like over 100,000. and. Mm. The uh, South American, like the RG supporters, bro, just go mad. And I remember just little pockets in the stadium. And it was almost like we were playing in um, like Buenos Aires or something. Like that's how loud and how how crazy it was. And um, where I had an absolute shock of that game too. Like, um, Sun, yeah, Sunday, early in the second half, Sunday made a break down, the, down my touchline and gave me an offload. And it was just like right in the grip basket bro and I was like two meters from the line and I dropped it oh true I was like oh shit here we go and then two seconds after that or a couple of minutes Argentina exited out um and then it was kind of just going out by the outline but I thought I could save it and keep it in I ended up like touching it and hitting it and it went out <laughs> so I was there lining up so I went from like a dead set try <laughs> opportunity to uh, with just my <laughs> Been marched back about 60 meters and we just getting a line out inside our own half. So I think I only lasted about five more minutes after that and got hooked. Oh, I did, yeah. Shit. I was just like, oh no. And then, bro, I remember like the review on the Monday, like that clip didn't even get showed, like about my like mm. stuff ups. It was, it was like a kick that I didn't chase. Um, we had like a, a set move off like a line out, bro, and I didn't like reload and get set properly and I would have been through like a hole if I had have done mm. that and so I was just getting <laughs> rubbish that, that hole and it's the first week of the World Cup as well so I'm yeah. like oh man this is cool yeah. alright come up for the next six weeks <laughs> uh, so that was yeah like that took a toll but I had to go and see um, Gilbert Anoka like the team mm. um, manager team psychologist that week just to put some processes some systems in place around like just focusing on my ability um like if i feel like i'm thinking about like outcomes or whatever or what ifs how to just be be present and be back in the moment did you feel like that worked yeah bro yeah 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 i had like um yeah this is probably crazy but getting into that first game i was kind of like almost felt I don't know if bulletproof's the right word, but because I was playing in the All Blacks, I was like, well, far out. I've got 14 other guys that are just going to rip up and I can kind of just coast through and, and pick my moment here and there. Mm. Um, it was, yeah, just a stupid mindset to have, really. But then the following week, um, who did we play? I think it was Namibia. And I was just like, nah, I'm like hungry. I don't want to go out there and just absolutely like, killer just had this like killer mindset and um yeah felt way better after that game uh, came off the field like you know i had heaps of energy i was doing what i needed to do i was focused my yeah work rate was up there all those sorts of things mm. and you didn't the starting winger spot for the big games didn't you so you were the you were the starting right wing come crunch time yeah 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 and it was it was hard because I know Weiss, um, he, he had a few like, nibbles with his leg. I think he had um, his break prior to World Cup. Mm. Um, so it was sort of out of him and I um, for that right-wing 
spot. And so uh, he is uh, he is an absolute beast that year. And it was good competition between him and I to try and get um, that 14 spot. I know Bender was another option if Bodhi was to go to fullback. But yeah, I was pretty glad that they had yeah, gone with me to wear the 14 jumper. Yeah. And then winning the World Cup. Talk to me about that. Like one of the ultimate highs in sport, I guess. But how, how did it feel? Like you're pretty good with explaining your emotions. What's winning a World Cup like? Um, yeah, but it was sort of like overwhelming. Um, sort of being in a big stadium where like there's so many things, like obviously tens of thousands of people, you can't actually, in a way, you can't actually see anything. So you're mm. just like, it's like you're looking into the abyss, just hearing all this like noise and stuff. Um, everyone's just like so happy and so joyful. Very like you look at like boys who are crying and stuff like that, of tears of joy. Just everyone was just so happy. And then we did like a lap of the field, and then there was that incident when that boy ran on the field. Oh yeah, and the security guard just went over the top like. Tackled him, Sonny gave him the, his medal. And it was crazy because I was sort of right there and I was kind of like, fire out, what's going on? Didn't know whether to like push the like security guard just to be like, bro, chill out. Like he's yeah. a 10 year old kid. He's not going like, to do anything to six foot 410 <laughs> shredded Sonny Williams. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, that was, that was pretty bizarre. And then got back around to like the tunnel and all our um, families and stuff with it. So, to be able to uh, embrace with them and just share it with them was cool, bro. But I remember, I think it was me, Tawira Kubalo and, and Leah Messam, they still had the little mini stage left out on the on the field and um, we were doing like snow angels, bro, on with the confetti. <laughs> Would have looked so, so like funny and random, mate, like these three, three grown men break your clothes doing snow angels and, and confetti, so... It probably sums up the sums up the feeling for us. Oh, living your good life. And then 2016, you're probably looking to build off that year, and then um, injury struck one of many to start. But I think it was against the Blues, eh? The first one, shoulder. Yeah, yeah. But round three, and um, like you were saying, because I don't know if it, well, I've heard the term in league that second year syndrome. Yeah. So like, um, players will kill it sort of their first year coming in, like their rookie year, and then they have to try and back it up. And like a lot of cases, they don't uh, for heaps of reasons. And so that was uh, something that was in the back of my head, trying to be like, hey, sweet, I just want to prove to myself, prove to everyone else that it wasn't sort of a fluke at 2015 mm. year uh, to build on that, but go to another level. And yeah, bro, I think it was round, yeah, that round three up in Auckland against the Blues, Ended up dislocating my shoulder, but it was so, so like innocuous. It was just the way that I'd been tackled, you know, hundreds of times before. And for yeah. some reason, my elbow kind of just got jammed and then my shoulder popped. And I hadn't I had a dislocated shoulder before or any sort of shoulder injuries. And so I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I was pretty sore. Um, and then the doc came on and was like, Oh, you've popped your shoulder. And I was like, Oh yeah, so yeah, what does yeah, what does that mean? Um, he said, I'll oh, take you out the tunnel and get it put back in. So we did that and then um I was like, Oh sweet, like what's the recovery for these sorts of injuries? I was thinking like maybe a few weeks to a month and then um Doc was like, Oh nah, you're gonna be out for about six months, so you're just gonna have to get surgery. And I was like, Oh, you're serious? Like mm. pretty gutted for just uh, that realisation. Like thinking, oh yeah, maybe a few weeks, but then six months in the whole season. So yeah, sitting in the medical room, I was pretty yeah, I was gutted, bro. Like had a big cry and sort of didn't know how to process um, process that feeling at that time. I was just like gutted. So um, yeah, from then a few weeks after that, like getting scans and trying to uh, figure out like what surgery looks like, what it, what the recovery is, what my next steps are, shit, trying to count six months from now, mm. what game am I going to be back for, all those sorts of questions and scenarios. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty tough. And I know what helped me very throughout that was just trying to set little milestones. Um, 
you know, first and foremost, just getting getting through the surgery, um, and then you know what the first week after that looked like, just taking it day by day, week to week, as opposed to you know getting too caught up in that sort of future mm. and oh, far out, I've got to be doing this by one month or six months time. This is where I want to be. It's kind of like far. Okay, today I'm gonna just do my rehab exercises, chill at home. Cool. Tomorrow I'll worry about that when it comes. Mm. Was there anything you didn't do in terms of uh, how you handled that that you would have done differently looking back? Oh, yeah, heaps, bro. Like, um, you know how I was saying, like, that after that 2015 final, like being pissed off and showing it in a way that wasn't good by just sulking and going into the change rooms, like mm. having – Having spaces in um, different situations where you can express your frustrations, like I used to be so short and grumpy, like with my wife, like to get her on a podcast and just gold in there for like partners and stuff like that that deal with their partners' injuries and um, yeah, so I was very like yeah, an arsehole um, so many times, and that's something I'll definitely wouldn't do again and something mm. I've learned through through my injuries is just sort of having that yeah being gutted but then just trying to have that little space between how I respond and what that response looks like. Um a few times like yeah I just wanted to just stay at home, didn't want to go out in public because you know everyone'd be like, oh you're injured, oh how's the shoulder, how's the shoulder? Whereas right, like you just want to write like a little brief <laughs> Hand out these little cards that have the answers on them. Here you go, mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100% probably just write like a little um, chapter on my forehead, eh? Cause, and like looking at that as perspective, though, like I know people just, you know, cared and just were supporting me and wanted to know how I was doing and if I was doing all good. Mm. But for me, it just kept reiterating the fact that I'm injured, oh, far out, the fact that I can't be training i can't be playing and so it was just like this keep putting me in this little rut um but yeah after a little while bro i came to realize that yeah people just care and just want to know well majority you get some pricks that are like oh <laughs> you're in the brain you know, yeah you know retire give it up like oh what do you do you like getting injured or something like that or mm. all those sorts of just random random thoughts and questions how have you handled those guys um, well, bro, like sometimes I do get a bit petty and, and just like bite back and just be like, oh, bro, like you've honestly got no idea. Like, of course, I don't want to get injured on purpose. Um, mm. Like, no, nah, I'm still training pretty hard. And like, I feel like I have to almost justify myself. Yeah. It's, it's like, well, what for? They're just a little, you know, sometimes they're just a, a profile picture of a cat on <laughs> Facebook or, or like a race car and I'm like why am I replying to like a race car <laughs> um, which yeah find it amusing half the time but yeah bro as, as well as that like realising you know the people who truly matter and, and the opinions that you, you should value and um, sort of be listening to most of the time is mm. you know your close friends and, and family like there will always be critics out there and yeah. Nice. Yeah. And then your run of injuries from that shoulder was shocking, eh? It was, seemed to be injury after injury. A lot of them were the shoulder too, eh? Yeah, bro. So all of my – I had a broken foot, I think, in there as well. Um, but, yeah, so that 2016 year, did my left shoulder. I was out for the whole – missed that whole year. So I got back 2017, and then, yeah, I did my foot, bro. So – broke like the three or four middle metatarsals so they put me up for about three months and then um i got back just before the british and irish lions tour and so that was sort of like a big um goal or objective to work towards was trying to get picked in that mm. um, i only played two games so i spoke to steve before the announcement and he just said oh look mate you haven't played enough footy to uh, warrant getting back in the squad for the lions tour so i was like oh fine. yeah like real gutted because it was still a goal of mine but i ended up playing for the maldives against them in um Rotorua. um and then got back 
and to the All Blacks, I think, for the championship in the 2017 for any of my other shoulder. Mm, that's right. Uh, and Africa, so I was out for another sort of six, six to nine months. Got back 2018, got back in the championship squad again for the All Blacks. Um, and then did my left shoulder in Japan, the All Blacks test in Japan. And then I was out. That was probably the second surgery. And then I had to have another clean up one that 2019 year. And so, yeah, bro. So, Brutal. It was a bit of a coaster. Did you find the injuries easier to deal with or harder because there were so many? Nah, harder, bro. Like, mm. My initial thought was that I would find it easier because I oh, yeah, cool, just that whole, what do you call it, like rinse and repeat in terms yeah, of my yeah. rehab and, and mindsets, bro. But it was like, that's probably where I came um, stuck in that thinking, like, cool, that whole resilience. Yeah, I've um, shown it with my left shoulder, cool, I'll just do the same for my right. But what was different, bro, was like my, um, were the goals that I was working towards. So after 2016, like that initial, that first injury was like, fuck, you know, I wanted to get back playing. I had all these second year syndrome, wanted to kill it again this year, prove mm. everyone wrong. And then I was trying to get back for the Lions. Then it changed to being like, okay, so we don't want to get back for 2017 Lions. Didn't make that, but then made the All Blacks, got injured again. So I was kind of like, everything kept resetting itself yeah. in terms of what my outlooks were. And then um 2018 i was like i need to get back out of my field to play some good footy to try and push for 2019's world cup mm. and then got injured end of 2018 which sort of was a write-off for my 2019 year and then i was just like fine now now what um yeah so it, it kept changing bro and i almost yeah would have to say that it was harder each each time because um yeah, the challenges or the the goals and the objectives I was trying to achieve were different each time, and I was almost mm. like a different person. Mm. It's interesting. And then you you signed with the Highlanders last year. How was that one? Yeah, bro, yeah, that was um, yeah, that was an interesting move. So I was sort of tossing up whether to stay at the Canes um, or yeah, an opportunity to go down south. And bro, I just wanted like a change, um, sort of a new club new play, players, a bit of a new town like down in Dunners. And, um, yeah, bro, I enjoyed it down there. It was probably hard because a lot of that time was spent rehabbing my shoulder. And so um, similar sort of mindset to how it would have been in Toulon was trying to, you know, you want to go just go somewhere and hit the ground running and, and impress from the get-go and start building relationships and, um, you know, adding value where you can. and. For me to still be uh, rehabbing, bro, it was quite tough. But um, all the boys and all the management were down there. Down there, we were real supportive, and I enjoyed my time down there. From from what I've heard from guys like Chow and um, obviously Solomon was on the other on the podcast the other day. How highly they spoke about the influence that you had on the Highlanders team and the culture, even though you didn't get probably as much game time as you probably would have hoped. Um, what you were doing in terms of around the environment down there sounded like you were having a massive influence. Yeah, bro, and um, I think it's easy because, like, a lot of it, you know, all the lads down there, um, yeah, run a pretty cool culture and all get along well with each other and mm. they go on, uh, you know, connections and, and things like that. So for me, that made it pretty easy just to fit in pretty well and, and just help out where I can, like, with Solly's situation, bro. Like, he's, I'm proud of him because he's one of many, like, Mm. he's just had the courage and shown you know true strength to actually first identify that you know he was struggling and then actually seeking help and if there can be more you know Solomon Alamalo's out there especially in our rugby community bro the better and um, yeah I was stoked to just spend a little bit of time with him and just chat through what I you know some of the stuff I've been through talking to you now and know that um, yeah he's all good so I'm stoked to See how he's all come through that, bro, and he's um, hissing down at Southland as well. But mm. yeah, the whole whole environment down there was, was cool, bro. And you always hear heaps of good stories about the Landers' um, culture and the and the connections that they drive down there. And it was cool to be a part of it. Mm. And what was it like going up against the old foe, the Canes? 
Um, yeah, bro, it was pretty interesting. Like, I think for where I was at that time, like playing this year or even preseason earlier this year, like my main sort of focus and headspace was just on solely me, just getting out there and, and getting back out on the footy field at that level, just trying to perform well and, and just enjoy it as opposed to like getting too caught up, I guess, and like, you know, my old team and, and ex-teammates and guys who are actually good friends. So um, there wasn't too much banter going on, bro. Like it's, it's yeah, I was so much respect for each of those boys, like the Arties and mm. and Nani and each of those lads. So, um, yeah, it wasn't, I felt, yeah, bro, I felt all right, eh, like playing against him. And uh, I think it was quite a hard case that game in Wellington we kicked off and it was like the first play of the game. They box kicked back and I went up for it and Nani tackled me. But I had bobbled, bobbled the ball so I didn't get a good clean catch on it. And uh, sort of he bro, he pretty much took me to ground like like he was probably putting his boy's seal to bed, like, to bed, like just so, <laughs> bro, so, un, so un- Nani like. <laughs> <laughs> so like yeah as soon as I was like bobbling it I saw Nani I was like oh sweet cool this is going to be the shortest game of rugby I've ever played <laughs> but bro he just like put me down to the ground like so gently and I was just like what the hell and like I uh, looked up at him bro and he just gave me like a wink sure I uh, saw him after the game I was like bro you like he took it easy on me, eh? and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> I was like, how, how can I even repay you? Like, just, <laughs> just thank you so much, bro. But um, yeah, that that respect was was pretty high, and um, yeah, I was pretty lucky and thankful for Nans, um, yeah, starting the game like that, bro. So I'll, yeah, always remember it. Mate, he was saving you for the turbos. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think that might have been before he signed his big, uh, yeah, big deal in France. But, uh, yeah, no, he's a good man, old He is indeed. And talk to me about your little East Coast cameo. That looked like good fun the other week. Oh, bro, that was so much fun. Um, Jose Gear, who, oh, a legend in New Zealand rugby, Māori, all black legend, all black legend. He took up the coaching role last year for East Coast and uh, he sent me a message earlier this year just asking my movements around Queen's birthday and said if I wasn't up to much to go up to the coast and play play for them in their centenary celebrations and um, as the time got closer I just said to him oh look bro I've been playing club down in Dunedin um, but if I'm not a bit in the mix or not picked for Landers that week I'll see if I can um, talk to the coaches and come up and anyway yeah the, the stars aligned and um yeah, I was able to head head back up home up to the Rotori and play in that centenary game, bro. And I was, um, yeah, it was so like refreshing, um, so like good for my like soul in a way, if that makes mm. sense. Like, bro, so fulfilling. Just felt like real wholesome. Just being like back up on the east coast, um, like the field, bro. You just see everyone pull up on their um, utes and everyone sitting on the back of the trays on their trucks. Horses are riding around the paddock just yeah. next to the field. <laughs> Kids are running around, like just about running on the field when the game's being played. Uh, just real, like, grassroots, bro. And um, for me to spend a lot of time back up that way when I was younger, like holidays and where my mum's family's from was huge. And, Used to watch East Coast play back in the late nineties, early two thousands in their in their glory years. And yeah, to have the opportunity to put the jersey on, bro, and, and play with a few few relations and play in front of family, play back up home. Uh bro, I was I was mean. If I could do it again, like I yeah, definitely dump it. Mate, that's cool. That's so cool that a guy like you can go back to East Coast and um give back to a rugby community which obviously would have been so stoked to have you involved. Yeah, bro, now it was cool and um, up that way, like it's definitely more than a game, like it's a culture, it's a, mm. almost like a religion up there and the whole town of, you know, a couple of thousand in Rotoria, the whole iwi, they all travel to the game and um, just to see how much sort of, just the atmosphere, the, the buzz and the hype, um, how much sort of talk there was leading up to the game and then to actually win, bro, was quite cool as well, I think it was their first First one in a few years, so mm. so to get a, a dub for for the coast was cool for yeah not only the team but 
all the people in. I think they celebrated, uh, you know, for a few days after that as well, which which is probably the biggest part of it. (laughs) And a nice wee inside bounce line from you too. Oh, yeah, that was a wee, um, we played Sam Parks, the nine, him and I, we sort of, in our, in our night before uh, prep for the game, our one hour <laughs> prep for the game in terms of our moves and stuff like that, yeah, we just thought, oh, we'll, we'll give this one a bit of a go and uh, yeah, lucky that it pulled off. Oh, mate, no wonder Manu Atu have got you coaching. You, you're a wizard, even in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Three body shapes, bro, body shapes, facing the hell of a but speaking of Manoa too, like what what are your plans going forward? What what's the plans for you? Um, or I want to yeah, obviously get back out on the field, enjoying this coaching cameo role. But yeah, I've still got strong motivations and that to keep playing the game. Uh, probably my you know ego and self belief is running on overdrive when I say that I still want to play at the highest level. Mm. Um, yeah, I still back myself to to keep reaching new heights. Um, but I guess for the interim, like right now, it's just about getting on the field and then showing what I can do. Like, or if I get on the field and play crap, then it's like, okay, well, man. <laughs> <laughs> ask, ask me again, but I just have this con- we'll have another conversation after I get back playing. <laughs> and then I'll just, uh, yeah, go straight into coaching, I'd imagine. But, um, yeah, still, still keen as bro to keep playing and, um, seeing where I can get to, but then like coaching is something as well that I'm sort of interested in, and yeah. quite lucky that this role has popped up um, to start exploring that space. And obviously, um, having some incredible mentors and and coaches um, being under their tutelage over the years, you know, I'm able to draw on them and yeah, use that in coaching, and but also bring my own flavour to it as well. Mm. Nice. And obviously your wife is a very successful actress as well. And what's her part of the plans? Has she got plans for you? How does that work? Pretty annoying that we're in lockdown and she can't be filming these big block, blockbuster films that um, I think Netflix has come to a bit of a halt with all the restrictions around um, quarantining and filming. But nah, she's she's put that on the on the back burner for now, the filming. Um, she's, yeah, she's at a law firm in, in Wellington, so she's... I don't know if you'd say real mahi, but but probably the heart of mahi is yeah she's working the the nine to five plus hours that that um, lawyers grind out these days and and the firm so um, yeah now nah, she's actually working from home as we speak so I'm sort of running the cutter I guess <laughs> oh how good's that <laughs> I yeah. thought you would <laughs> anyway mate as always we've gone to our Instagram for some questions. Geez, that's been good stuff in there, but I know we've got a few questions come through. Uh, one of them was, you sort of just touched on it, but what has motivated you to keep going? Um, I just started pushing myself. Like, um, I don't know if it's a it's a curiosity, like just trying to figure out, you know, what I'm what I'm capable of. Like yeah. that whole, I don't know what's the word, like potential. Um, you know, what even is that? What are the limits and is probably like my wife might say a different thing, like going through all the injuries and, and all the setbacks and things. She would just want me to pull pin and park up and I don't know, try to be a lawyer as well. But um, nah, but I'm motivated by just yeah, wanting to keep testing myself, keep pushing myself and, and see what what my limits are with the our limits. So that's yeah, probably trying to be something like David Goggins or something, but <laughs> <laughs> something humble like that, eh? Uh, you both got similar mindsets, both absolute beasts. Okay, have you ever thought about going to the NRL? Yes, yeah. Did this happen yeah. a lot throughout your career? Um, yeah, I did, bro. Like, uh, it was kind of hard because rugby was sort of taking off, mm. but then it wasn't until might have been after my second shoulder injury where I was like, far be keen to just try something new, like. I was sort of entertaining all these thoughts around just like pulling pin, like, you know, if I kind of over all these injuries, um, try something different. And yeah, having that experience in the 20s and where I still love watching um, NRL go to the Warriors, um, don't know if I could go back now. Like, it would be a pretty, pretty big ask, but you know, I was always keen on trying to 
just give it a crack and it was probably from like not making NRL as well. Mm. Just, you know, the whole far out, could I actually make it, you know, that sort of question that, yeah. that sort of put a doubt. Um but no, nah, still bro, I love the yeah, love league. Eh? Mate, if if man or two goes no good when you get out there, go to the NRL. <laughs> David Goggins at come on, let's see yeah. that. Far. I'd love to see you give it NRL crack. Jeez, watch the space. Get some league CEOs on, on your podcast, bro. And, um, just top line over <laughs> okay. We got heaps of heaps of questions about your side step, as you could imagine. Who was the hardest player to step? Um They're all easy for you, eh? It's like <laughs> no, no, this, no, the no. second one. No, it's, nah, it's it's a long list of hard players, bro. I'd probably say um probably Malachi. Oh, true. Yeah. Yeah. I, bro, I was always a tough day at the office, bloody one on one with him because he just, I don't know if I should give away the secret in terms of what he was doing, but <laughs> uh, nah, he, he just shut down my space, bro, pretty much. Like he would just get up real fast. And so yeah. that'll just put me out of, out of step with my timing. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Make it hard for me to shut down. <laughs> you are you testing yourself. I love that. Your mindset to just yeah. keep growing. Okay, this one's from a young prodigy, Ruben Love. How and when did you practice your stepping? Oh, Ruben Love. He's, he's an ex up and comer. Eh? Mm. How and when? Oh, bro. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably getting a bit of stick for this, but we had <laughs> these collections of like Steinliker. These big sort of wooden boxes, bro, that we had at home when I was a young fella. Yeah. Um. Obviously, they were collected over many, many, many years. <laughs> uh, but we used to have like a little sort of rumpus room, this little uh, basement space down at our house, and I'd set them up, bro, like probably about three meters apart from each other, and I'd be like in that room for about like an hour, hours, bro, just stepping, just going back and forth, just pacing through the house and. <laughs> Mum and that would be like, come on, dinner. I'm just like, no, 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 just 10 more minutes. Just, bro, I was just like step sweating, like coming out the thing, like, what have you been up to down there? <laughs> so you were just like, bro, 24 7, either stepping down in like the rumpus room, these tiny um, cases, or bro, I used to like make an absolute um, mess of our back lawn. Like, I'd put my boots on and I'll just be like, trying to step so hard that I'll try to make divots in the ground. True. And I'd be in so much trouble where I'd be hanging out washing and I'd be stepping the clothes on the clothesline. <laughs> any any opportunity I could get to step, bro, like probably even in like the supermarket, I'll be like stepping people in the in the um aisles and that. So Oh right. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I always thought it was more of a natural thing for you. Like you were just sort of naturally gifted with this Amazing sidestep, but you were working hard on that craft since a young age. Oh, bro, yeah, sharpening that that craft and like back in the um, BCR days and having the videotapes, like we used to record games of Benji Marshall mm. um, when he was playing for the Tigers, like the early 2000s. Where I'd like just watch that go outside, practice for five minutes, come back in, watch another side step, go outside, practice. Bro, I'd just be like back and forth to the lounge sure. watching them and go outside and practice. And that's what I say to heaps of like young kids now when they ask me, oh, how did you practice your step? I'm like, mm. just go on YouTube. Um, look Google, at like me. <laughs> Google me. Google me, Milner Scudder. No, I'm, I'm down the list. I'll say Sean Johnson, Benji Marshall, um, Kalen Ponga. Yeah, bro, there's so many and just – it's been like half an hour. I just watch them go out, practice their footwork, what foot they jump off, they land, what they do with you, and, and there you go. Mate, it's that easy. Jeez. Love that. That's awesome. Speaking of those two, um, Sean Johnson and Benji, who would win in a one on one on the seven meter touchline? You, Benji Marshall, or Sean Johnson? Oh, definitely not me. I'm just trying to think who out of Benji and Sean. Bro, I feel like Benji's the the goat. He was mm. the he was the ultimate bro. And I, yeah, I know maybe Sean might have like would have been watching Benji's clips back in the day as as I was too. So yeah, probably give the throne and and the mantle to Benji. 
Oh, fair enough. He is an absolute wizard. Uh, what is it like playing for the Dragons down in Dunedin? Oh, the mighty Zingarees. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, that was all the time. Down there at Monticello Park, I actually had a, um, yeah, a couple of good games down with um, Zingaree. Had one last year, actually, and then a few this year. And uh, we actually went pretty good. I know they're a bit of a battler club in terms of results but um, yeah we notched a few wins this year and there was actually one that sticks out was um, Bally he broke the record for the most club games I think it was over like 200 plus um, and we got the win for him on that day and there was a bit of a Sky Sport little um, all access oh nice <laughs> all access piece on Bally and, and his build up to, to his record breaking game so nah bro I enjoyed um Enjoyed my time at, at Zingaree. A lot of great people at that club. Good stuff. Shout out to the Dragons. Okay, this one. This is an interesting one from the great man, Tim O'Malley. Okay, Bruce, did you sign a Tassie contract for 2021 drawn up the pub by Bruce? Oh, he sent through the photo too, unless he's forged it. <laughs> oh, Bruce, jeez. That, um, yeah, that, is, that is correct, but I don't know if it's terms and conditions. We had sort of... Um, <laughs> Fully, fully laid out what the T's and C's were and yeah I don't know if it was official there were no there might have been a few witnesses present um, when that when that <laughs> happened but oh geez yeah I've signed some contracts in my time <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh I'm looking forward to working with you when we come out of lockdown we'll make that happen absolutely okay who is the best winger of all time um the big Jonah um, Corey Jane, uh, Cheslin Colby. Oh, yeah. Um, so they all like came through different eras in a way. Like, Siege might get a bit grumpy because he played him and Cheslin are too far apart. But, um, yeah, like, say if you were to compare like Jonah to Cheslin, like, two completely different players. Body shapes, different eras, um, defensive systems, and like skill sets that, that we required back then versus now. Um, but then ultimately, like who's just carving up? Like mm. Cheslin's unreal for the last few years, um, and then Jonah was was an absolute weapon as well in his time. Um, so I'd probably yeah probably put those two together. I like that. Okay, next one. Um, have you developed any effective coping mechanisms during injuries and what were they? Uh, yep. So effective coping mechanisms, a big one for me is having a plan. So what I struggle with is uncertainty um, and I struggle when I don't have control, when I'm not in control of something. Mm. And so um, a good mechanism for me is having a plan so trying to but it could be just the plan for today having a few key things that I want to focus on and tick off my to-do list um, that helps me sort of stay in control of what I what I want to be doing um, what else with injuries uh, being able to talk to people about it yeah um, it's it's a big one having people you can trust whether it's you know a partner or a good friend or family member or professional support. I think being able to articulate and actually express what you're feeling and what your thoughts are is real healthy. Like I know for me, that's what I struggled with was actually I didn't know what I was feeling, let alone how to explain them, let alone how to actually overcome them. Mm. Self-awareness is a big one. Um, so those are probably two key big ones for us, having a plan and then also um, having that support and, and feeling like you can talk to someone or knowing that you should talk to someone about it. Um, yeah, is key. That's powerful stuff. Big fan of that. Okay, last question. This will be good. One piece of advice you could give to any person in the world. One piece of advice. Um, just to be be more, I don't know, it's pretty like a cliche, eerie fairy one, but around like being kind to yourself and being kind to others. Um, with that, is like not being too quick to judge. Yeah, trying to just, I'm trying to think of like something straight to the point, like that's without waffling on and giving you a whole novel or <laughs> like <laughs> advice. But yeah, just being kind to yourself and others um, and not being too quick to judge, I reckon. 
Mate, that is powerful. That is powerful stuff and a and a great way to finish what has been one hell of a yarn. Honestly, really appreciate you coming on the podcast and um, giving an insight into your career, which has been an amazing career. I've loved following your journey, mate. When I first met you in the Hurricanes wider squad, I knew you were going to have a great career, but it's been quite hard to watch in terms of the injuries, I guess, and seeing how frustrating it can be. I mean, as a fan and a friend, it's been hard watching, so I can only imagine what it's been like for you. But what you're doing in the space around mental awareness and um, being open with your struggles has been so influential for so many people. And, mate, you're having a huge impact on not only the rugby um, community, but New Zealand's community as well, I think. And um, so much respect for you as a person for doing that. So really appreciate you coming on the podcast and giving up your time, mate. Oh, no, what an absolute legend. What a mentor, what a lad. Um, Jimmy <laughs> Mark, like, it's been an absolute pleasure, bro. And I think um, what you're doing and what, you know, there's a few other people out there with the podcast, like creating these spaces for us, um, you know, myself and, and all the other guests you've had on and, and the ones you'll continue to have, is actually be able to speak in like an open, non-judgmental well we'll see what the comments come back with but uh, in a space you know where we can be sort of ourselves and and speak um authentically and actually talk about our stories and our you know those highs and lows because um you know in terms of the you know, I, I will say it traditional media outlets and journalists um that's what stops boys from actually being able to say what's really going on is because uh, we don't control that narrative and there's other things, other agendas at play. But mm. um, so, yeah, what you're doing, bro, and, and I hope you continue to do it is just keep giving these young men and young women all these spaces to, to be themselves and to talk to their stories, which will no doubt help um, help others and help the next generation coming through, bro. So, uh, yeah, no, nah, thank you. and. Yeah, always reflect fondly of, of those times back at the Canes. There's uh, having a mentor like you, bro, is, is uh, yeah, kick-started it all. So, um, <laughs> nah, brother, thank you very much. Hey, mate, what a lad. Really appreciate it, bro. Look forward to um, having you down in Tasman soon. <laughs> Top man. <laughs> Brucey, what up? What a lad.